only a couple of groups have come by to talk to me about the lab. Okay? So, um, I just realized I need to, everyone make sure you see this. So, if there's something clearly wrong somewhere, don't submit it. It's the last thing I want to see, right? In fact, I'll probably give it back to you. Okay, so seek help. If you can't figure out what the problem is, talk to other people or come and see me, right? Does anybody have, is, is, are things going okay on the analysis of this? No. Yeah. But it occurred to me, uh, since not many people have come by, and I was recollecting the past and dealing with physics at this level, that this can happen. Students will just, oh, this is what we got. You know, we got, you know, 7.2 meters per second squared for the acceleration due to gravity image. Sir, can you just explain uh, basically the error bars that you're asking for? Uh, more the, importantly, what, what is the calculation then as far as the certainty of that? Like? Well, the, the software will give that to you. Whether you use Excel or MATLAB. Do you guys use MATLAB? A lot of students here take a MATLAB class. I don't know about you guys. Okay, so use, um, the, you can use the... You, you would need to find the... It's technically called the standard deviation of the mean. I think Excel causes, call, call, calls standard it the error. standard error, but you want to make sure it's of the slope, not of the intercept, not of the correlation coefficient. You want the uncertainty of the slope, of the velocity versus time graph. The slope is g, is your experimental value of g, and you want to know the uncertainty of that. Okay? Uh, uh, <laughs> manually, so didn't get that. Manually on a calculator? Yeah, you can get the standard deviation. You can, you can do that. Wow. But there's a, 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 a so you sum the squares. That you, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think you guys did this. The, the slopes, you know, I averaged all the slopes. No, no, wrong. Yep, you need to see me. Nope. <laughs> what you did was it sounds like you calculated the average accelerations and you, you found the no no there's a there's a reason why you do not do that and I didn't ask you to do it and there's a definite reason and it's actually kind of surprising uh, it, yeah so come by and I'll, I'll explain it to you All right um, if we have to have an extension on the due date of the experiment, of the reports, we will, okay? Because I'm tied up all afternoon. And I don't have a lot of time. I don't, I think, yeah, I don't think I have any time today. So, if we can't, if there's problems, we'll just extend the deadline, okay? All right, so let's look at these problems. Uh, first is a, one of the questions. Here's the situation. This is number four. We have, and this is just to get you to think about kinetic energy, right? We have these, um, this is kinetic energy versus time. These three different curves here <coughs> for kinetic energy versus time. And what they refer to is a block sliding uh, to the right in the positive direction across a frictionless floor. Now, they, I guess they don't... Oh, I'm sorry. And we're given uh, three different situations here for the... There's two forces in each situation on the block. One, a positive force to the right and one to the left. And it has some initial velocity there. So if the force is balanced, how's the kinetic energy going to change in time? It doesn't, obviously doesn't change time. It's one half the mass times the square of the velocity. It's not going to change. Okay, what about this situation? This one actually should have been third, but... So remember, we have this initial velocity this way. Now, the net force is impeding the motion, so it's going to slow it up. But eventually, what's going to happen? The block will momentarily come to rest and then it will start speeding up in the opposite direction. So the kinetic energy will look like this. We start off with some kinetic energy and it will momentarily go to zero. Remember, it doesn't depend upon the sign here. So it will it'll have to bottom out here at zero and then take off like that. Um, 
and finally the third one, here we have a net force to the right, so it's just going to speed up. So the kinetic energy will just increase like that, something like that. From its initial value. Okay, it's pretty simple, but it's just, you know, it's, it's good to do these concept, this conceptual stuff, right? Any questions about that one? Okay, the next one has yeah, the famous greased, greased pig question. <laughs> uh, this goes way back. So here's the situation. <clears throat> there's, there's an object at the top of these uh, three different ramps. They're frictionless ramps, okay? <clears throat> and they... Um, all bottom out here, okay? So they all go through the same H, and if you have a hard copy, it's, it's good, I, I wrote this on mine, it's good to put H here. <coughs> You'll see why in a moment. So it starts here, right? Let's call this H, this height H here on the ground. And the question is we want to um, rank each of these three slides here. This is A, B, and C, but we're going to see it doesn't matter. That's why I didn't put it down there, I guess. Rank them according to the gravitational, the work done by the gravitational force. Now, I have to tell you, when I see this, I have to stop and think, right? Okay, the work done by the grav, what is that, you know? And the reason is, we're going to essentially get rid of that. Once we get into the next chapter, we're going to stop thinking about the work done by gravity and we're going to replace it with something that's conceptually much simpler and more powerful. It's called the gravitational potential energy, okay? So you just have to bear with this. I keep telling you, it's this long development for energy conservation. But you'll remember that we derived this for any path. Remember, the work done by this constant gravitational force is minus mg times the change in the y coordinate. It only depends upon y. And the change is the final minus the initial. So we get this. Now, because they all have the same change in y value here, the work done by gravity has to be the same. It's path independent. And that path independence is, turns out to be fundamental and it leads to potential energy as we will see in the next chapter. But for right now just struggle through with this. This is the work done by gravity, okay, as we derived it. So the work done by gravity is the same and is it, it better be positive, right, because the motion, the displacement is downward in a downward direction and the force is downward. Is this negative? Is this positive? Yeah, the final y value is less than the final initial value. So this is positive. And it will be the same for each one. So taking, they don't ask this, but the next thing to think about here is what's the, um, what's the final kinetic, how do the final kinetic energies compare? How would you rank, as they do in these concept, you know, how would you rank the final kinetic energy? Do they ask for that? I don't know, they should have. So how do you rank them? Same. They're the same by the work kinetic energy theorem. All right, the normal force does no work, it's frictionless. So um, they all have to have the same kinetic energy. The work done by the net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So the work is the same, so the change in there, and the, the object starts from rest in each case. So the kinetic energies will be, they'll have the same final speed, all, all three situations. Okay, any questions or comments about that one? So now the problems. The first one, uh, this, uh, so this clearly actually happened, a large meteorite, meteorite? Shouldn't it be meteor? What do you guys, you guys are really dead today. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thursday. 
it's Thursday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It is. It, it, I know what you mean. I, I understand. <laughs> is it meteor? Is it meteorite or meteor? I thought a meteorite has to strike the Earth. Okay, it doesn't matter. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, okay, what? What? So that kind of stuff parallels what you know. I'm looking at you for an answer. Uh, <laughs> is that a meteor? I think we hey, you guys, can, you guys can go on the internet and find out. But. Yeah, I think it passes the Earth. A meteorite passes the Earth, whereas a meteor, a meteor is up in, up in the sky, and a meteorite hits the Earth. Yeah, so this skipped along the atmosphere, so I guess it's kind of, maybe you can go either way on it. Okay. All right. Okay, so now we can do the problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this was a this was this was a dramatic, as as described in here. And um, here's an estimate for the mass. Four times ten to the six kilograms. The speed. An estimate for the speed. Fifteen kilometers per second. That's moving, right? This is astronomical kind of stuff. Big speed here. Um, so we're going to suppose that instead, instead of skipping there, suppose it had just went right into the Earth, okay, with the same speed, about the same speed. So um, what kind of um, the loss of kinetic energy, it has this kinetic energy, it strikes the ground, and then it's just going to be obliterated. There's a little bit of a problem here. There's going to be some of that energy, that kinetic energy, will go into ejecting mass, right? But um, uh, yeah, but it's lost all its kinetic energy. Yeah, we're just—it's it, lost. It loses all of its kinetic energy. Okay, and that goes into heat, and it goes into the kinetic energy of ejection. Well, you know, we're getting. When you go through conservation of energy, this long process, you can't help but talk about the concept. We're, ta we're talking about conservation of energy here, without, and you're accepting it, and it seems very reasonable. You know, we got this kinetic energy, and it's going into these other. We haven't really done that yet. We haven't, we haven't um, quantified that. We haven't discussed it. We just discussed it sort of superficially. But you, it's, it's hard, and probably wrong to, you know, not to do that, as we go along here. But anyway, we're going to just, uh, the, the, this meteorite is, uh, is obliterated, okay? So it loses, all of its kinetic energy is gone. Uh, so how much kinetic energy is that? Well, this is simple. Um, its final kinetic energy is zero, so it's just going to be, the, the change in kinetic energy, technically speaking, the change in kinetic energy is negative because the final value is zero and there's some initial kinetic energy. And the initial kinetic energy is just one half mv squared. So we plug the numbers in and we get these kind of large numbers here. And I guess it's appropriate to go to, what's this, what's the capital T stand for? Which is, yeah, that's actually become popular, right? Where is? Terabyte. Storage. Tera yeah, okay, I, I was thinking of something else, but you're right, terabyte, mem yeah, you're right, that's the main thing. But there's another thing, another uh, sort of technical... Pterodactyl. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just think that up? God! Uh, you should be a comedy script writer or something, you're in the wrong... Uh, that's, uh, you just thought that up? Come on, no, you heard it or something. Wow. Okay. Was that your answer? <laughs> Is that what no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would have Wow, that's clever. Okay, I'm gonna write that down to tell my colleagues. Tara T D. T D will make me remember. Okay. No, it's terahertz. Have you heard of terahertz? Maybe in some thesis oh I don't know if you guys go to thesis opportunity presentation. Although Adam I think went to mine. Is that you? Okay. Um, terahertz. What's what's the big deal? Computing power goes much. Scanning. For you know, 
weapons and stuff like that. There's this range in the electromagnetic spectrum that it's really hard, it's uh, really difficult to generate. The terahertz, so this is 10 to the tw roughly 10 to the 12th hertz. It's tough. So there's a lot of activity now in in sensors and and um, transmitters that'll deal in a terahertz reason, region because then you can get images of people you know before they get onto airplanes or stuff like that better images or something and of and also of um, you know luggage and stuff like that and or anything you know stuff coming on a ship you know that you know this shipping with shipping with ships is a big deal right and they have these huge cargo the standard they're just huge and you know those, what are they called? God, it's, it's, Thursday, it's Thursday, right? <laughs> what do they call those things? Those cargo ships. Yeah, kind of cargo ships. Conics box. The conics box. The, the, the metal box. Yeah. <laughs> so they have, I thought they had a specific name for these big metal boxes, but maybe they don't. But, you know, they coming into this country, do you know what percentage are inspected? with any reasonable, it's like, you know, less than a percent or something. It's some, really, it's something very low. So it could be that this terahertz, um, yeah. So I, I, I really know very little about it. I just know that it's a hot topic. Okay. So we've got uh, 450 terajoules is the amount of energy lost here. The change is negative, okay. We can convert that to megatons, okay? There's 4.2 times 10 to the 15th joules in a megaton of, that's a million tons of TNT. All right, so to convert it, we just have to get the unit, you know, it's gotta be, this is what we choose. We don't choose four point, we don't invert this, right? Because we won't be able to cancel the joules. So we get 0.11 megatons and uh, this was just on on a documentary. The, the most powerful bomb ever exploded was by the Soviet Union. It was a hydrogen bomb. Do you guys know how many megatons it was? Come on. <laughs> I think it was, oh God, I just saw the doc, you know, this. all this is in the news, why? What is today? Today's the 70th anniversary of the, the atom bomb on Hiroshima, right? So anyway, this was a monstrous bomb and they, they took film of it. And you gotta see the film, it's just, it's unbelievable. 15 megatons? Yeah, I was gonna guess around 10, in the order of 10 or something. It's 10 or 11 or something like this. Yeah. So, and everyone agrees that was just crazy. You could never really use it. Is real, you know, what's the point? Well, the point was, you know, we we did it. We Russians did this. You know, look what we can do. Okay. So anyway, it's this was this would be actually less than that that bomb, I think, right? By a couple of two orders of magnitude. So it was around ten. It was. A, did somebody say it was fifty? Oh, wow, fifty mega fifty megatons. Yeah. People would worry that it would ignite the entire atmosphere of the Earth and all this. There was this worry. Oh, yeah, it was unbelievable. Okay, so uh, what has become a standard since Hiroshima is, is uh, to compare things to Hiroshima, to the Hiroshima explosion. That was 13 kilotons, okay? So we can um, take our kinetic energy here. We'll take this, might as well take this is better. And to convert it to Hiroshima bombs, we would divide by, there's 13 kilotons per bomb. So the, the, the kilotons is gonna cancel with the megatons there, but you have to, there's a factor of 1,000 that I put in here somewhere, here it is. So I converted this to kilotons, I can cancel them. So that was, um, it would be about eight and a half Hiroshima bombs, this meteor, a meteorite. Um, any questions about that one? Okay, 13, there's, this is, this is, <laughs> I don't know, I think it's kind of interesting. It's not real obvious here, but we've got this um, box, this is a, it, it doesn't matter whether the, whether the floor is, I don't think it matters we're given the forces here. We're given all the forces on this block. 
So I was trying to think, it really doesn't matter whether it's frictionless or not, because in, a frictional force could be absorbed into that force. But let's, I think we better imagine, forget it, let's just take it to be frictionless. Yeah, and they, they said that too, okay? So it's frictionless. We're given these forces, including the directions here, okay, the magnitudes and the directions. And the box undergoes a displacement of, of or trunk here, a displacement of three meters. Now, you'll notice something here. We don't know that it's initially at rest. We don't know the initial condition. Right, so what am I driving at by that? I, I just know that it moves from here to here. These forces, um, they're of course going to have to sum, oh, instantly, where's the normal force? It's absorbed into here, okay? We're, we're just, we're just going to assume that it's absorbed into there. And the gravitational force is probably that, okay? So we don't really need to worry about the details here because we're given the forces. But if you look at this, the fact that this can, ha can have an initial velocity in that direction, these forces, the net force could be slowing it up or speeding it up or not doing anything. We don't know until we analyze it, right? This is general. Yeah? Would you have to resolve the normal force into force two to make, to make that, what you just said, happen, have happen? Yeah, yeah. So this is the information that we're given. And like I said, they didn't have to say it's frictionless. <laughs> that could be absorbed into the X component of this. <laughs> yeah? Why are you making the assumption that the normal force is in, F? you said to F2, why, what leads you to that assumption? Well, I assume this is on like the Earth or something like that. I assume there's a gravitational force down on this. And then, so there's gonna have to be a normal force or it would go through the floor. That'd be nice, that'd be interesting. That'd be a good demo. <laughs> yeah, okay, so look, we're getting, this is, I shouldn't have got, I, this is silly, okay? Just, look, these are the forces. Don't worry about this other stuff. It's just, it's their fault. They should have really, uh, I think, been a little clearer about this. But I just want to tell you, this is, it really doesn't matter because, you know, we're told all of the forces. And that's, that's all we need to know. We don't need to know where they came from. It's, it's actually not relevant here. That's the point, I think. And whether or not they were trying to make that, I don't know. Okay, so the first part here is, what is the network done on the trunk? By, by the, uh, I think they want us to calculate each of the works. So we want to count the, we're gonna calculate the individual works here. So the work due to force one. Well, it's a constant force it's a straight line displacement in the same direction. The work is just going to be the force times the distance. And it's going to be positive because the force is in the same direction as the displacement. So by the definition of work, it's just going to be the force times the distance, 15 joules. What's the work done by force two? Okay, now we got a problem. You know, the displacement's this way, the force is this way. So the first thing I see here is that the work has to be negative. And you can see that because the standard way to look at this, there's different ways of looking at it, but what's going to be important here for the work done by force two is the projection of this force onto the x-axis here, which is negative. So it's all in our formula here. If we, t we take the force, the magnitude of the force, which is F, this magnitude, multiplied by the magnitude of the displacement and the angle, the cosine of the angle between them. Remember, that's our definition. It's F dot D for constant force and a and a straight line displacement. That's, what the, that's the definition of the word. So we just punch this in and we get a number and it had better be negative. Okay, that's actually a check. If it wasn't negative, we would have made a mistake. Uh, what about the work done by force three? It's perpendicular to displacement, so it's zero. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero, it does no work. The force is not acting through a, dis through a distance through a displacement. It's not acting through. There's no displacement in this direction, so there's no work. Now, we've, um, if we want to find the work done by the net force, it, may, it sounds like what we need to do is find the net force and then find the work, right? 
But we don't have to in this case. Because the net force is the sum of these, if you dot these with the displacement, we find that the net work is the sum of the individual works. So we could do this. In fact, I wrote this down here. Um, if you want to confirm our final answer here, you can actually find the net force. This will be an alternative way of finding the final question here. We're going to find the change in kinetic energy. You can find the net force and then find the net work due to that. But because the net force is the sum of the forces, the net work is just going to be the sum of the works. So we've already calculated the works, we might as well just add them together, right? It's easier. But this is an alternative here. And the work, and you'll notice, and this is really not obvious until you do the calculations here, the net work is positive. It could have been negative. Okay, so if this component had beaten, you know, had beaten this out, this thing would be slowing up as it moves as it moves here, which could be the case, but it's not here. So the final, the uh, change in kinetic energy here has to be positive because it's positive work. The work kinetic energy theorem tells us that it will gain kinetic energy by exactly the amount of net work done on it. That's the work kinetic energy theorem. Okay, any questions about this one? Okay, so here's, okay, so I'm going to tell you one, one more time. These are kind of boring problems that, you know, and they're, and maybe boring is not the right word. It's just they can be handled so much, much simpler from conservation of energy point of view, but we just haven't gotten there yet, okay? So these are exercises just to make sure this stuff, you, you get used to this stuff. But we're going to be able to unify it with potential energy and it's conceptually much easier to do these, a lot of these problems from an energy conservation point of view. But we're not there yet. Okay, so in this problem, this is 20. Um, there's this mass here. The force is exerted this way. Okay, not, not straight up, Force, that's, which is certainly, that can be done, right? And we know the mass, we know the displacement, D there, yeah. And Earth's gravitational field. Um, frictionless ramp, okay, and we know the angle of inclination. What is the net work done by the, on the book by this applied force? by gravity and the normal. We're going to find each of the works again here. So this applied force here does a work given by the force. We can use this because it's a constant force and it's a straight line displacement. Well, this is not always true and we're going to do an example of that later, a problem in that. So, this is straightforward. The product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between these two vectors here. That's 30 degrees. So I get 8.66 joules. That's the work done by the applied force. What's the work done by gravity? Well, from a vector point of view, this is the work done by gravity. There's, you know, often will it, <laughs> this is also equal to minus mg times delta y, right? This is just a different way to express it. And you can see that this is right. This is actually kind of a nice way, I think, because, you know, we've got mg and we're going to dot it with the displacement. The work is going to be negative, although it looks like I missed that the first time through here. Um, and why is this negative? You can see g is pointing this way. This vector is pointing that way. So it's got to be negative. And if you want to not have to, sometimes students say, well, I don't want to have to think about this sign. How would you do it if you didn't want to think about putting the sign here? How would you do it, sort of a, without having to worry about thinking about this? What angle would you use between, the, between this vector and that vector? What's the angle? I think I, did I say this? Yeah. <coughs> 120 degrees, right? It's 90 
plus the 30. So, if you want to strictly adhere to the definition, you can do it. You would write down MGD, these are magnitudes, and then you would write down the cosine of 120 degrees. And you punch that in, and because, because this is beyond 90, you're going, to get, you're going to get the negative sign. So most people, you know, that's one way of doing it. Most physicists don't, they just look at this and they go, you know, they're, they're just taking the component of the displacement here. They know it's going to be negative, but you can, this is, this is entirely correct here. And that will give you the negative sign. So anyway, however you do it, um, this is the answer. This is the answer for the work done by gravity. Now you'll notice I drew this here. What was I thinking of here? I was thinking that um, what I'm doing is I'm finding the um, component I'm finding the component of mg, the relevant, um, you know, remember there's different ways you can interpret the dot product. You can think of it as, in this case, I can think of it as, the pro it's the projection of this vector onto this, onto this, this, in this direction right here. So that's what I'm doing. I'm projecting, the, remember we talked about this when we introduced dot product? I'm projecting, all that's relevant here is the component of gravity along this, this dimension right here. And you can see that it's negative, calling up positive, and it's mg sine theta. So that's how I did it. But any way you want to do it, just do it right. What's the work done by the net force? Excuse me. What's the work done by the normal force? None. Zero. Zero. Perpendicular, right. Okay. So, uh, B then is... Now we're told that the book is initially at rest, so therefore it has no kinetic energy. What's going to be the final kinetic energy, or the final velocity. Well, we can use the work kinetic energy theorem here. We know that the change in kinetic energy is the work done by the net force. The work done by the net force is going to be the sum of these individual works. And you can see that it happens to be, po it could have been negative, but it happens to be positive here. Right? This is greater than the magnitude of that. So we sum the works. And that's going to be the change in kinetic energy, which is just the final kinetic energy, because it initially has no kinetic energy. Right? Final minus initial and initial zero. That has to be the work. That's the work kinetic energy theorem. So that allows us, we can solve for V here. We have one equation and one unknown, and we get that it's about a meter per second. Okay, any questions about that one? <coughs> Okay, the next one is 42. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a difficult problem, okay? But I thought you guys should see this once. You know, you all know calculus. And so here's a case where we have a variable force. There's a mass that's constrained to move along this axis by whatever reason, you, any mechanism you can imagine. This has to move along this axis axis, okay? And there's a force exerted here. Somebody's pulling this at a constant, with a constant force. So the tension has, is constant in here. But you can see what's happening. It's, and it starts here, the mass starts here, and we're going to consider an interval from here to here. This is the origin right here. So, do you see that this is a variable force problem? As the mass moves this way, what's, what's relevant here to accelerate this mass is the component of the force in the x direction, is this component of the force. But what's happening to that component as it gets closer to the origin? Shrinks. It's getting, shrinks? Is that, somebody says shrink? Or would you, I couldn't hear. You get, I, I know I'm gonna sound like your parents right now, but take your hand away from your mouth. <laughs> what did you say? Shrink. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So it's a, this is a variable force. This is a variable force problem. So the work is not the force times the distance. I mean, the force is changing. So we have to, 
we think of a small, over a little small motion here, dx, the work done is going, there's no work done by the normal force, gravity's irrelevant here. So the work is the force in this direction times the distance. The force is the tension times the cosine of theta. All right? And this distance here, dx, dx is negative, so we got to put a negative sign in front of it. Okay. Because the work has to, sorry? Can we just assume that that's the positive direction? Yes, you can do that. Yep. But you want to be careful here, because in calculus here, this dx, you integrate from x, x1 to x2, that dx is negative. So you've got to be, you got to be careful. This is a case where you really want to physically check your signs to make sure that's right. Is the work going to be positive or negative here? Is the thing going to speed up or slow down? It's going to speed up, you know? The, we're doing positive work. This component, of the force is positive here. So if I didn't put this sign in here, and you start to, you do this integration, you're going to get, you're going to end up with a negative work. So you have to be, it's one of those problems where you have to be careful with that. Okay, so this is dw we need to integrate because theta is not constant. So what the, we're integrating this, you'll notice we have mixed variables here. We can't integrate this as it stands. We've got to come up with a single variable. So I chose x here. You can choose, you know, theta, you can choose theta or x, and if you're interested in this, I encourage you to do it, to eliminate x in terms of um, theta, you can do that. And I don't know what's going to happen to the, how, uh, the integral may be easier or harder, I don't know. But I chose x here, it seemed natural for me to choose x, because you can see the cosine of theta is x, over, well, maybe it doesn't mean it's not obvious, but it's x over the hypotenuse here. The hypotenuse is the square root of h squared plus x squared. So I get this. And why was I happy when I found that? Why does that make you feel good? It looks complicated. Did you see that we can get a perfect different, we can integrate this. Yeah. And if you don't see it, look at this. Differentiate this, we're trying to find a function whose derivative is equal to the integrand here. And then we can use the fundamental theorem of integral calculus, right? So if you differentiate this function here, you're going to get this denominator. And then by the chain rule, and you're going to get a 1 half. And then by the chain rule, you're going to get a 2x. So the derivative of this is exactly equal to the integrand. So now all we have to do is just evaluate this anti, so-called antiderivative, right, at the endpoints. Um, and you'll notice I just, I, I can get, I, I switch the limits and change the sign here. Because I really, I'm more comfortable going from a small x to a big x, right? And I can see that this is going to be positive. I know this work physically, I know the work has to be positive. And I'm going to get a positive answer here. And there's the expression that we get. It's not, this is not a simple problem. And you might wonder if it's correct, right? And the reason I asked you to do it algebraically instead of what the book does, is because we can check this. What's the special case we're going to check this in? It's not much of a check, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, when h is equal to zero. When h is equal to zero, now we're pulling with a constant force. We know it. the work has to be just the force times the distance. So if we look at our answer here, and, um, oh, incidentally, I'm sorry. So by the work, this is, um, this is the work done by the net force. And so it's going to be the change in kinetic energy. And you can see here, this is one, I'm sorry, there's two checks we can do. There's two checks we can do. The first one, one of them is by the work kinetic energy theorem, because this is positive, because x1 is greater than x2, this is going to be positive. Our expression here tells us that positive work is done. This thing's going to speed up going to gain kinetic energy, which we know has to be the case. It's got to be the case, because this force here has a component in that direction. So the fact that this is positive is a check on the solution. And this is an important check because it's a lot of people, including me, have made a mistake right around in here with this, 
I, I, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I made a mistake here. It's just, it, you just tend not to recognize this minus sign here. And then you're off by a sign. You say, well, how can that be? Well, it's, it's there, right there. The other check is the h goes to zero. In this case, it's, the answer has to be just t times the difference times delta x. And if you look at this, you set h equal to zero, you can see that we get that. It checks out in that case. That's just a constant. That's simple constant force, not a variable force like it is in general for this problem. So it's a little more challenging than the usual homework problem, right? But it's kind of interesting. I think it's interesting. It's good for you to see it. Any questions or comments? Okay. So let's see, 44. So this is elevator. We know the mass. It moves, oh, this is real simple. It moves a certain distance, 210 meters up the shaft in 23 seconds. And we're told that this is a constant, approximately constant speed. So what is the average rate, at what average rate does the force from the cable do work on the cab? So there's a force here, there's a tension force. Here's our force diagram. There's a weight, there's this tension force, and they have to balance, right, because it's moving without we're told it's moving without acceleration. That's important here. So T has to be equal to mg. The power, the average power, um, technically there should, I should have put a bar over here, but it's not going to matter as we're going to see. The average power is the total work divided by the total time. That's the power delivered by that force, this cable force here. So the work is the force times the distance. So it's going to be mgh. The times is delta t. We know all these numbers. We plug them in. And we get like a quarter of a megawatt. It's a lot. It's, you know, we consume so much electrical power. It's just remarkable, right? You saw that yesterday. Um, OK, now there's another thing we can do here. The, uh, this is the average power. But the fact that it's a constant force, because it's moving at a constant speed, const, uh, it, and the, the force exerted by the, the tension of the cable is constant, it's going to be, um, the average power is going to be the same as the instantaneous power. And you remember there's this formula. This is convenient. We don't use it a lot at this level, but it gets used a lot at higher levels of mechanics. The power is the force times the velocity. Actually, in general, the instantaneous power is in general is this. Because the work is F dx, and then if we divide by t, we get F dot v. So that's the instantaneous power um, in general. Well, you, can have a, you can have in any dimensions, and you can have non-constant force. That's the instantaneous power delivered by this uh, due to this force. So we can check that here. Our force is mg. This is not much of a check. It's essentially the same, but it's slightly different, okay? What's the velocity here? Well, because the, it's moving at constant velocity, it's just going to be the total distance divided by the total time. So it's distance h delta t. So when I take this and substitute it into here, I get this. And that's exactly what we got here, okay? From a slightly different point of view. Okay, any questions about that one? Okay, there's one more here. And I, strong, I, I, I have a strong feeling that we're going to do a similar problem in the next chapter, but from the point of view of energy conservation. We won't use the work kinetic energy theorem. We'll have this simpler way of looking at it, okay? But right now, this, this is what we have to settle for. So here's the idea. There's this mass. It's in a, we're in a gravitational field here. 
and it's going to strike this spring. And what we know about, we don't know the initial velocity. This is one of those kind of inverse type problems. Usually you'd be specified this and you would calculate like what the maximum distance the spring is compressed. We did a very similar, or maybe we did that problem in a lecture. So I think we did. Did we do that? This sounds familiar. So that's a sort of standard problem. You know, you're given things and you want to find the, how the system responds. In this case, it would be one the natural question to ask is, what's the maximum distance the spring compresses? But uh, sometimes that's not practical. And that could be the case here. We don't know. It depends on whatever situation you're in. But here we're given the maximum compression distance, and we don't know the initial velocity. So that's an example of what's called an inverse problem. Um, <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, right now, just knowing we're, we're going to use the work kinetic energy theorem because that's all we know. Right? We don't know the full. We don't know energy conservation yet. So we're going to do it from that point of view. So they, ask, they guide us here on how to do this. The first part is to find the work done by gravity. Okay, so the interval of the motion here is starting from here, um, just before it hits, right, to where it momentarily comes at rest. That's our relevant interval of motion. The work done by gravity is going to be the force times the distance. And I know this has to be positive because it's displacement's that way and the gravitational force is that way. So the work done by gravity is mg, times this com maximum compression distance. And I can calculate that. I get so many joules, okay? What's the work done by the spring? Well, again, you know, I see this and I, I have to stop and think because this is not, we're, we're gonna replace this and think about potential energy. But for right now, you gotta remember that the work done by a spring starting from the relaxed length is one is, is minus one half k times the displacement squared, one half kx squared, or kd squared in our case. And there's got to be a minus sign here because when the spring is compressed, the, sp the, the spring is exerting a force this way and the displacement's that way, so it's got to be negative. Okay? But we, we integrate, we found this by integration. It's in the, you know, it's, it's in the lecture notes. But again, we're going to have a much easier way of doing this kind of problem after we get into the next chapter. So I know all these, I calculate them, I get this, and now <coughs> we're going to use the work kinetic energy theorem. The work done by the net force is the sum of the individual works, as we've seen several times earlier, okay? And that has to be exactly the change in kinetic energy. What's the final kinetic energy over the interval of motion we're focusing on? What's the final kinetic energy? It, it's zero, right? Because it's coming to rest momentarily. So the change in kinetic energy is minus, is minus the initial kinetic energy, which is one half mv naught squared. And that's what we're trying to find. And it's got to be the work done by the net force or the sum of the individual works. They're identical. So I know these. I just add these two. And you'll notice, when I add them, I'm going to get a negative amount, right? If I'd gotten a positive amount, we'd, we'd be in trouble. Why is that? What if this is positive here? What's the problem? Um, we're solving for V, right? It would be an imaginary, it, we take the square root, it would be an imaginary number. So I don't know what that means. So if we had, if we were, if we added these things and got a positive number, because of this minus sign, we're not going to get any meaningful kind of velocity. So you have to go back. We would have made a mistake. You have to go back and fix the mistake. But it is negative here. You can see this beats that out. So the minus signs are going to cancel, and we just simply solve, you know, clear this out, take the square root, and we get a, that's the initial speed. 3.5 meters per second. So again, this seems so clumsy to me anyway, because I know how much easier it's going to be when we do this in the next chapter. So we'll, we'll start to get in that Monday. Okay? But again, it takes some development. We've got we to develop potential energy. But once we do that, then we establish the conservation of mechanical energy. It's much easier to solve this problem using conservation of energy. And as, as, a, uh, prelude, as a prelude, 
here's what we're going to do. And I'm pretty sure, I think I, I told you, I'm pretty sure we're going to solve this, something very similar to this problem. There's an initial energy here in this system, right before it hits, right? Then there's a final energy. Now the final energy, the initial energy is kinetic energy, right? And there's also going to be, in general, some gravitational potential energy. Because this thing is in the gravitational field of the Earth, the higher it is, the more potential energy it has. The more energy it has that we can extract from it. When I allow a weight to lower, I can take that and make, you know, can do useful work. So this has some initial energy, and it has some final energy. What's the final energy? Positive. What? Okay, the final is when the moment it comes to rest. That's what we're calling the final. That's what's relevant for us, right? Initial and final is our, our, at our disposal. So this is the initial state. The final state is when it momentarily comes to rest. What's the kinetic energy? Zero. Zero. What's happened to the gravitational potential energy? Well, it's gotten less, right? The final energy has to equal the initial energy by energy conservation. So we just set those two things equal and we solve. We don't have to worry about this. That's where we're headed, okay? And I, so I, I've mentioned it so many times that I thought I might as well tell you what the, what the bottom line is here. So that's where we're headed. It's a much easier way to solve problems, much easier. Conceptually and just calculationally, it, it's simpler. And you get the same answer. You get the same answer, but it's just much easier to do.